did ask for recording, so okay, here we go. Uh, hello everyone, wherever you are, morning, afternoon, evening, thank you for coming. We're back at the sixth convening of the Zoom sessions around this question, this kind of existential question of what is a library if the building is closed. And we're, we, we started this as a three-day series from March the 26th, 7th, and 8th to talk about three aspects of this question being internet access, these things that relate to how, what a library is and services provided, internet access, digital services, and physical materials. Uh, spent one hour on each of those. Of course, we could spend an entire day or a week on each of those, but we, we spent a, an hour on each one of those as we kicked off the series. The last session we had, um, we uh, participation from uh, Denmark, Christian uh, in uh, Copenhagen was talking about and, and helped and you know, remind us of the, the, the role that libraries play in the social infrastructure of their communities and you know, to a larger extent uh, the world and how people depend on libraries and, and the role of libraries as space. So what this has been the kind of the topic for the last number of years, you know, libraries as, as, a, as a, a third place and a space. So what, what's the impact of that? So he was very eloquent in talking about, you know, how much people depend on libraries, how emotional it gets for people when they're cut off from an, an, an essential service like the library. I mentioned our hosts, thank you very much again. And uh, so, so I just mentioned what, you know, what these, uh, we start out with these first three elements there and then added the social infrastructure element thanks to Christian uh, and his presentation last, the last session that we could go Friday. The libraries are closed, but libraries are open. Yeah, what does that mean? Our point that we want to keep repeating is this, uh, this one is that assuring access to public information is an essential service. Right now, the discussions of what's open and what's closed seem to revolve around what constitutes an essential service and what is just, you know, normal necessary business for, for most people. And our contention is that unless you have access, then you are you are severely you're dangerously disadvantaged if you you're relying only on broadcast medium tv radio uh or a telephone uh then you are really underserved and it's not only to your detriment but to everyone's detriment because you each of us needs to know what's happening around them and in and generally so making that point uh should help libraries have more flexibility in what they can do as far as trying to reopen or provide their services or get just simply have staff be able to access the building. So uh, assuring access to public information is essential and it's what libraries do. And it's what libraries do best. So make that point right now uh, as you're expanding and, and uh, trying to accommodate all these needs because very soon, if not already, the, the blank checks that are being written, the trillion dollar checks that the U.S. is writing and similar kinds of scale checks all over, all over the world uh, are gonna come due. And uh, so where is that money gonna come from? The usual way in a budget crunch is that, especially the cities, right? They're imagining they're losing a lot of their tax base, the sales revenue, all these kind of things are just pretty much shut down. So massive budget crunches in our immediate future. And so the case for your value as a library needs to be made and emphasized, not sort of mobilizing your supporters already in anticipation of that discussion, shall we call it, but uh, you need to think about that. Uh, Gigabit Libraries is who we are, uh, open collaboration of, of libraries doing innovative things. Techniques. And uh, it is, I hope I'm coming through, I'm getting an unstable connection myself. But uh, anyway, welcome. So we've got some uh, great speakers today from Arizona to Africa. We, we thought that, 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 that a little was kind of fortunate, but we didn't plan it that way. It just worked out that way. Uh, Nicole will kick us off here in a minute and then we'll hear 
from uh, the chem and from Hayford. And the chem, I believe, is based in Nigeria. And we'll, we'll get to the introductions. Uh, shortly. Uh, is this announcement library services? Uh, just on Monday, they announced that they were releasing 30 million of the $50 million that was appropriated by Congress under the CARES Act, I think is the name of it, basically for stimulus. And so IMLS has already announced how, how much and how that will be, how those funds will be uh, distributed through the state library agencies. This is the normal flow of funding in the U.S. from the from the federal libraries agency to the state library agencies, and then to support various kinds of uh, uh, local technology projects. Uh, and that's not all where all the fund goes, but that's, that's where the majority of the funds for the agency goes. And that's where this the same path, which is an excellent, well-established process to evaluate projects and support them and track them. And, I just pulled out probably the most self-serving uh, part of the statement, which is found at that link there uh, at the bottom. And I, it's also in the chat. I put it posted at the top of the chat to use these funds to expand digital network access. As I say, it's just untenable for people not to be able to know what's going on. And, and if we're all consigned to our homes, we're restricted from our movements then our sources of information communication are massively re reduced. And the most obvious kind of broadest example of that is the closure of the schools. So in the U.S., there's some 50, 55 million students for, in, in K-12 through high school. And school is out you know, almost everywhere. Uh, rather, school is not completely out. It's online. And if you're not online, you're not at school. That's where school is. So we can't have school unless all the students are at school or have the capability to be at school. This creates, this has taken what we've been calling this embarrassing digital divide and turned it into a completely intolerable digital chasm. So addressing that has become a top priority in the country. Of course, connecting everybody that doesn't have a connection is kind of in that same category, but the students we would have to say have, have the top urgent, most urgent priority. Because having them have to be at home causes their parents to have to be at home and not even give them the opportunity to work if they, you know, unless they can go online, uh, that they may very well need to. So it is, the situation is urgent. We're in a crisis and it is a, a tough one, that, like the, the likes of which we have never seen before. So what, what, what does this probably mean? They haven't released the details on this, but if we just look at the, the network access part of that, um, there are, you know, certainly strategies. I mean, we've been slowly and uh, building out the infrastructure, but it's been constrained by various market forces where so-called unprofitable markets, basically, you know, areas of, of urban areas and generally rural areas that don't represent the required return on investment that the carriers require to invest in that infrastructure. And we used to call this universal service when there was a basic service that was considered you know, something everybody should have affordable access to, pretty much applied to the telephone, electricity, but the, with the arrival of the World Wide Web in the mid 90s, it kind of went away and we said, well, no, we're private enterprises. We're not public utilities any longer. And so you don't really tell us where we need to invest and so forth. We'll do it as we can, as we think is appropriate. And that's the way the infrastructure has evolved since is that it's been pretty much up to the carriers. The regulators try to do what they can, but it's really difficult for the, for the regulators to do anything against the interest of these very powerful carriers. Uh, so, how to do that anyway and do it immediately is, is the question, and that, that's what I think IMLS is trying to address. Um, there's a, the, a link from that page that gives the list of funds by state. It's based on population, and you can see some of those numbers uh, 
uh, by each state. And so how much of that will go to, the, it lists three areas, one of which is uh, access area. Uh, if it's even a third of that, it's a substantial amount of money. And especially if the projects are uh, lightweight, uh, like wireless projects. So Wi-Fi, library Wi-Fi specifically is what we're talking about here. Since access to the facilities and the machines uh, inside the library are, are unavailable, this is the way we're connecting to the library and through the library to its digital services, one of which, probably the most popular of which is the internet, but also don't forget there are tons of, of library uh, digital services, you know, the whole e-materials, uh, there are librarians themselves that you can communicate with, uh, databases, so there's a lot more than just the internet, but that is uh, probably what is most popular to people. We've seen the, the kind of the first order of response to this, which is opening up uh, the Wi-Fi just outside the building. <clears throat> and uh, of course, it's an obvious thing to do, and I think and, uh, uh, and I think the great majority of libraries have already done this to the extent that they can. Of course, you have to be able to get to the library, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, drive-by computing is our, new, uh, is our new order of things. But the, there are also ways to go farther than the parking lot. We saw last week a presentation from, uh, uh, from Southeast Nebraska where they're building this wide area uh, wireless network that leverages the, the capacity at the school, which has a great fiber connection, to wirelessly extend that to the small town four miles away where they're distributing the signal to cover, well, this small town. Rural parts of the country uh, are thought of as being very low density, and that's true when you look at their, you know, county level density. But most of the people live in small towns in the center of those counties or around in those counties, maybe just a mile or so across. So this is, this is an ideal circumstance for these kind of mesh wireless networks that I hope everybody is thinking about because as soon as the, as the actual details of, this, uh, of, this, uh, of these funds are released, I have a feeling the, the urgency is a cue there that they're looking for projects that are what we would call shovel ready. That is to say, in place, with a plan, with a budget, technology identified, and so on. This is a long range, this is the same technology that they were using there in Nebraska, uh, using these TV band frequencies that can go a long way and around uh, obstructions, buildings, hills, and even pass through uh, uh, things like treetops. Uh, this is kind of a general, it's just a, a graphic repeat of, of what uh, the, the slide showed, but it's a hub. In this case, the hub would be a library and the, the kind of projects that we've been working on that then send the signals to these remote locations that are then uh, have a regular Wi-Fi uh, hotspot. So a hotspot of regular dimensions around each of those, or each of those buildings or facilities or now parking lots. Uh, this was the goal of this, to availability of uh, library Wi-Fi that one in three adults in the U.S. depends upon. It's an amazing number. And also to think about community resilience, how those networks could, could uh, operate even without, in a lights out scenario. I've been working on this for the last three years. Of all the disasters we were anticipating, pandemic was not among them. Yet, here we are. So uh, with that, I won't get into these flavors of Wi-Fi, but there are a number of them. They have different properties. Uh, but this kind of a network is, is something that wirelessly can be done today to, as, as a response. So with that, no, we'll go to our speakers. And first up, uh, we have a presentation from Nicole in, and in Arizona, and she is going to tell us about what's happening in Arizona, but she's also going to uh, tell us about uh, various efforts by state to uh, set up uh, uh, maps 
of, of available public access points. Uh, this is a way to just, there's a lot of response going on. This is a great example of that and it's valuable stuff and it's kind of what we're all trying to help happen. It's more access points, even if we can't get everybody's home connected immediately. At least we should be able to get people a place to go nearby, walking distance or certainly driving distance uh, to get access. So Nicole, please, uh, please introduce yourself uh, properly, I apologize, and, and take us away. Thanks, Don. Uh, good morning. My name is Nicole Umayam, and I am a library consultant with the Arizona State Library Archives and Public Records. We are a division of the Arizona Secretary of State. I work for a department called Library Development, and our mission is to empower Arizona libraries to offer excellent customer service uh, through grants, consulting uh, resources, and in some cases, direct programming. Um, our team does a lot to support libraries, and I just wanted to uh, share that our Arizona library staff are uh, truly amazing and resilient individuals who are going the extra mile to serve their communities. Uh, Don mentioned, uh, you know, the types of things that we look at when we consider what a library is uh, when the building is closed, and I would just add that librarians are still a key part of uh, making libraries uh, happen and serve their communities. Um, in Arizona, we hear about different things that libraries are doing to respond to the uh, closures and their community needs. Um, we've heard some libraries uh, partnering with different uh, community entities like the police department or town halls to still offer access to laptops on a one-on-one -on -one basis and thoroughly wiping them down afterwards. Um, we even heard stories about librarians helping patrons uh, through the window. Uh, one librarian said they helped a patron sign up for their unemployment benefits on their cell phone uh, while the librarian was inside the library and they were standing outside. So um, lots of incredible stories that are coming through from our Arizona librarians. Um, I wanted to begin uh, this presentation with an, a nice picture of the inside of a library building, just uh, so we can all remember how nice it is to be inside, um, as well as when we're talking about uh, library Wi-Fi in the parking lots. Okay. So I first got interested in uh, collecting data on library Wi-Fi back in 2018. And at this point, I heard from a library system for the first time that they were actually shutting their Wi-Fi off um, after hours. Um, I thought that this was an isolated incident, but as we talked to more and more libraries and collected data, we found out that um, actually half of Arizona libraries are leaving the Wi-Fi on 24 seven. Um, and um, so that was a, a little bit of a surprising instance. So I wanted to set that backdrop because this was all before um, the coronavirus hit. Um, once libraries had to close, uh, they were quick to realize the value of um, still providing that free wireless signal, even if the building was closed to the public. A lot of Arizona libraries were publicly announcing their Wi-Fi as a resource um, and giving some direction about the, uh, the extent of the, the wireless reach outside of the building. Um, by providing the service, libraries were able to meet their patrons' demand for the internet access in order to complete schoolwork, uh, file for unemployment, and meet other critical information needs. Uh, because we had already had an interest at the State Library in looking at uh, library digital capacity and uh, the availability of Wi-Fi, we had that base level data from our uh, annual public library statistics. Of course, that reporting period uh, was from July 2018 through June 2019. So we really didn't have an accurate uh, on the ground picture of what was available for people's immediate needs. Um, so here's a picture of our public library Wi-Fi map uh, as it stands today. Um, we started with that baseline data from our annual public library statistics, and then we surveyed our libraries uh, to ask for supplemental information. 
And so we've, we found that in response to the coronavirus closures, um, some libraries are indeed extending their hours uh, or changing them to 24-7 availability in the parking lot where available. Um, in, in, and this was really a great way to start some conversations with the rest of our Arizona broadband stakeholders um, and other state agencies, as well as with our library uh, communities at all different levels. Um, we're able to provide data on the speeds um, of, of that library service, as well as their um, library systems and other contact information. And we're able to do this pretty quickly. Because of this project, we were uh, able to uh, partner with the state land department here, who then created a statewide map of available public Wi-Fi hotspots um, in public buildings, um, as well as internet service provided provider hotspots throughout the area. So here's a screenshot of um, a, a close-up section of Arizona. So you can see the spread of libraries and service providers, as well as some community submitted Wi-Fi locations, um, which includes things like community colleges and a couple of businesses. Um, of course, I'm interested in uh, improving this resource for uh, Arizonans and learning what we can from other states and other places um, who are also trying to provide this important data to meet people's immediate on the ground needs. So I reached out to our uh, state library text group and uh, our uh, National Digital Inclusion Alliance listserv to ask about who is uh, mapping their Wi-Fi locations in this way. Um, this is a picture of a map from the Arkansas State Library of all of their uh, Wi-Fi uh, library locations, and they also include Wi-Fi uh, wi information, uh, such as passwords and the Wi-Fi hours, um, as well as the branch information there. Um, I really love the state of Arkansas, and I, I hope to be able to uh, float the Buffalo River sometime soon, <laughs> once we can go outside. Um, the main state library, um, in uh, coordination with, an, um, with Network Maine, which is the main uh, research uh, and education network, has offered a program that they term the Study from Car Initiative. And this is actually a separate guest Wi Fi uh, network that's available for K 12 schools, higher education uh, ent entities, as well as public libraries. Um, they report that this, uh, this big map of public Wi Fi. Uh, was so popular that they started to add in uh, businesses and churches and other um, entities that have Wi-Fi available, even if they aren't part of that original network. In Wisconsin, um, they have also have a, uh, a Wi-Fi map. Um, the data that is collected from the different entities differs. Um, but I have an example of um, what happens when you look at some of that Wi-Fi data and um, they give some specific feedback about, you know, just where in the parking lot somebody might need to go in order to have, have a, a strong connection there. I really like, um, I really love the display on this map as well. Um, Vermont also has a Wi-Fi map. Um, in this case, they are visualizing the data based on um, password availability and if the network is open or not. Um, they also chose to have a public disclaimer about uh, social distancing best practices when individuals are in their cars. Um, and I, I really liked that model as well. Um, and we have this beautiful example from North Carolina. Um, it was created by their broadband uh, infrastructure office. So this map shows uh, libraries, schools, and other entities that have Wi-Fi availability. And that's mapped on top of service areas for in, uh, internet service providers, um, which I believe is a great resource for North Carolinans because they are also then connected to information about uh, any offers that those service providers have uh, for, um, for meeting people's connectivity needs 
during the crisis as well. So this is a, a gorgeous and an excellent, uh, excellent resource for North Carolinans. Um, so you can find links to uh, all of these maps as well as other, other maps that are being added every day um, by going to the National Digital Inclusion Alliance and checking out their COVID-19 resource page. Um, one broad uh, observation that I did have about all of these statewide maps is that they're really great at displaying where the public buildings are um, and some of the ISP hotspots, but there's a lot more uh, work that can be done to provide information about businesses. So all of those uh, McDonald's and gas stations and other businesses that might have Wi-Fi available are slowly being added to these maps over time. Um, but um, it will take a little bit more coordination and effort to make sure that we have a, a map that truly represents all the possible places that people might be able to go to get connected. So it's great that we have this uh, Wi-Fi map, um, but it's not very useful if we don't know if the signal act actually reaches to the library parking lot or not. Um, and as we had more and more discussions with our stakeholders here in Arizona, um, we realized that there might be an opportunity to support libraries in extending that network access um, if, they are, uh, if they are able to do so. Um, so we are currently reaching out to libraries about the extent of their Wi-Fi signal um, and what sorts of uh, challenges they might face to boosting that Wi-Fi signal to be able to uh, safely provide that service in the parking lots um, while, the uh, while the building itself is closed. Um, we are collecting data for our partners at the state broadband office um, to look at uh, potential ways to support, uh, support this project. Um, we know that a lot of Arizona libraries have already been doing this on their own. Um, this is an example from the Buckeye Public Library System. Um, and we know some whole counties have been boosting their Wi-Fi signals, such as Apache County and the Yavapai County Free Library District here. Um, so they've already taken an initiative to offer this service. Um, from our preliminary data, we know that a lot of libraries are actually reporting um, that their signal reaches the parking lot just fine. Um, so it might not be uh, every library's immediate priority to, um, to reach their customers that way. We also uh, need to know what, um, what the backhaul capacity is for those libraries. So it's great if the library has Wi-Fi, but if you have 10 or 20 cars in the parking lot to a not very fast connection speed that um, that uh, experience is going to be severely limited um, for people to be able to connect. Um, in our public library statistics, we added questions about library connectivity, including the available download speeds of libraries throughout, um, throughout Arizona. Um, you know, this isn't a great picture of how networks perform over time or in response to uh, multiple users. It's really just a one single snapshot, but it does give us an idea of where opportunities are for libraries to uh, really improve their signal. So in this case, we are looking at um, a range of download speeds for libraries. So the greens and blues are libraries that are um, offering services at above 25 megs down, which is the FCC benchmark for broadband service in the first place. Um, and as you can tell, we also have a lot of libraries that are not meeting this, uh, this threshold. Um, and so, you know, that the importance of being able to uh, off, offer resilient uh, broadband access is really highlighted at this time, um, but we know that it's been a problem even before um, the, the closures and the additional need for, for internet service. Um, I'll mention that there's other state libraries that are also collecting this data. Um, the Texas State Library uh, and Archives Commission uh, has actually conducted statewide speed test days where they invite all of their libraries to take a speed test and then they uh, map and make that data available. 
Um, the Washington State Library has also conducted uh, technology and broadband uh, surveys of their libraries outside of the public libraries uh, statistics. And that includes information about uh, available speeds that service providers are listing and if those libraries are actually receiving those speeds as well. Um, so we know the, the main question that we're looking at is what's the role of the public library in meeting the needs of those who are underconnected or those who are falling behind um, on the wrong side of the digital divide. Um, we've started looking at some data from the American Community Survey about broadband subscriptions at home, as well as uh, households that have uh, computers or smartphones or tablets. Um, and these yellow marks on these two maps are actually of the library locations on top of it. So we think that this is useful to start conversations with our broadband stakeholders and our library stakeholder network as well, um, and to begin planning at the statewide level those areas that might have most, the most impact. Um, we also know that um, in this time where there's additional uh, strain on library networks, that um, we need more information such as, um, you know, how are libraries tracking Wi-Fi sessions? Um, what, how is that network performing over time? Uh, what sort of network security uh, exists uh, for those libraries? Um, and we also need information that um, is harder to capture with uh, data, such as, you know, what is the relationship of the library to their local IT staff? And um, how much support do they have at a local level? Um, I think I will go ahead and end there. Um, Don, do you have any questions at this time? Or are we going to move move on ahead? Thank you, Nicole. Uh, excellent. Uh, it's it's great to see so many efforts uh, to mobilize uh, information and compile it and make it available in useful ways. I, it seemed like that was about six or seven states that you uh, that you uh, showed. Uh, is there is anyone kind of collecting these on a national level? I mean, you did it just by digging around, but does anybody has that responsibility? The state library associations, do you know? Well, there's certainly no uh, designated responsibility. Um, you know, NDIA is a great resource. They're a unified voice for all digital inclusion policies and programs. They have a lot of library affiliates um, and they are um, serving as that one-stop shop for getting a national perspective. Um, but in terms of public Wi-Fi availability on a national level, um, I'm not sure of any, any maps that exist. Um, I would also point out that cities and regions um, who didn't make my statewide map are doing some great work as well. So looking at, you know, looking at Charlotte um, as, as one example there as well. And, well this is uh, great. No, this is great work. And, uh, you know, it, it gives people an option. Like I say, it may not be the ideal connectivity, like a you know, broadband in your home, but it is, is a resource. One, it it can save your your data cap on your phone if you have one, and then also, uh, uh, you know, a, uh, if you don't have anything, it's a place to go. And so that's a starting point. And I think when we're talking about response, you, what can we do first, and then what we can build on. So that's that's terrific. It's a great story. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Ramona if she's on to introduce our, our guests from uh, Africa. Uh, James Walker, I don't know if you can hear us, but we can certainly see you uh, as you walk along there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, hi, hi to everyone. Um, okay. Ramuna, please, you please hear me. Yep, yep. Go okay. ahead. Yeah, so my name is Ramune. I work in the organization called Electronic Information for Libraries, or in short, IFO, is a not-for-profit organization that works with libraries uh, in developing and transition economy countries to enable access to knowledge uh, for studies, research, and community development. 
I will not take a lot of time because I think it's, it's more interesting to hear what our speakers uh, uh, have, have to say. I just uh, want to introduce two uh, representatives of our partner organizations in Africa. And first, it will be Mkem Osigwe. I hope I pronounce your name <laughs> correctly. Uh, so she works in Af AFLIA or Africa Library and Information Association. That is umbrella organization for libraries and library related uh, institutions in the continent of Africa. And you can compare this organization to IFLA on global level. And the second speaker is uh, Hayford uh, Siaf from Ghana Library Authority. And Ghana Library Authority supervises a network of over 60 public libraries across the country. So NCAM represents a kind of international, continental view, and, and uh, Hayford can talk about, about Ghana and, and what really interesting things he has done over the years to, to prepare to an ex expected situation and now he can really serve communities in, in Ghana. So before joining AFLIA, um, I just will tell a few facts. Before joining AFLIA, Nkem uh, has been the director of an agency Nigerian Book Foundation in Oka, um, an organization that is dedicated to the development of uh, indigenous book industry in Nigeria. She also was, before that, she was head of uh, Professor Kenneth Dyke uh, State Central e-library located in Oka, the capital of city of Anambra State in Nigeria. Uh, NCAM is known on the international level uh, uh, in professional networks and she's very, very active in, uh, on social media, promoting libraries and advocating libraries and that's why she got an award for, from Nigeria Library Association for advocating and promoting libraries. Uh, and a few words on, about Hayford so that uh, I will not interrupt the, the, the flow. So Hayford, uh, before joining Ghana Library Authority a few years ago, he was he come he came from NGO sector where he has founded a very successful street library project that was bringing mobile libraries to rural communities and were addressing literacy and education issues in Ghana. Now he successfully leads Ghana Library Authority, as I said, 61 or maybe now 62 uh, public libraries across countries. And over two, just two years, really very short time, he, he transformed, I think, the situation there and keep, keep going. So that's my introduction. Thank you, Ramona. Uh, I just wanted to add that uh, we got a little bit of a late start, so we're probably going to run over a little bit. And at the end of the, the formal presentations, we'll stay on for anybody that wants to talk about things. Sorry, I took too much time up front, but uh, let's carry on. So, Nakem, please. Yeah. Hello. Can you see my screen? Yes. Oh, great. So, um, <clears throat> like Ramona said, I am Nakem. Nkem in my language means my own, uh, and I'm a librarian, of course. So we we um, we are looking at what's happening in Africa with um, the pandemic and how African libraries are reacting. Libraries are closed. That one is a given everywhere now. You know, because um, you can't keep the doors open with the virus. And um, <clears throat> but this is a situation that we, we never like imagined that would happen. You know, it, it's, it's strange 
the way things are, are going, for libraries that have always been opened every day, except maybe on Sundays, all of a sudden everywhere is um, closed. And um, you, you, you kind of have to find out what do you do now? And we are learning that libraries are more than buildings. You know, like this um, pictures here in uh, Kenya, they are providing services online um, uh, in um, South Africa too, in, in, in uh, Zambia, in, um, in many parts of Africa. Of course, I wouldn't talk about Ghana because Hayford is here and um, they are doing wonderful things. <clears throat> Most of these pictures here are actually from the, from the social media handles of libraries across Africa because um, many libraries in Africa do not have the capacity to provide free Wi-Fi like um, Nicole was talking about. You know, we don't even have that kind of map, but I'm sure that we look into that going forward. So many, many librarians now use the social media to um, communicate with people as much as is possible to, to spread information about the pandemic, you know, like, um, um, and, and then to carry on their services to the, the National Library of um, South Africa. Uh, this month is their poetry month. And they are still um, talking to people about it, you know, coming up with um, um, poems and, and asking people to, to read them and, 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 and so on. So services are ongoing as much as we can. But the, the main problem for us in Africa is the one of misinformation. Because now look at, the, look at our, at our um, literacy rate. It, it, it is, is below the world's average. And when somebody can't read and write, it, it, the person will find it easy to um, take in any story about anything, like um, this story about 5G <clears throat> as the cause of the virus, or some people that say that it's only for rich people, the people that travel, that, 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 that the people in the villages can't get the virus. So AFLIA has been trying to get librarians to react to all this, to help cross-check information, to, to help stop the spread of misinformation, to, to, to translate the information available into local languages like in nigeria we have more than um, i think we have more than 200 to 300 local languages and there are people that speak only their own and they don't understand english so we are trying to translate as much as we can into our local languages so that people will have access to that information then um, um South Africa has been doing that too, and um, local groups in, um, in, 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 um, in Nigeria, in Uganda, and all over Africa, we are trying to translate what already exists. That knowledge, information from, from, from who? Informa information from the um, disease control um, agencies and um, to spread that amongst our people as much as we can. Then um, some people also go to communities as much as is, is possible now to tell them, see, anybody can catch this. Stay indoors, wash your hands, maintain social distancing. Then for, for AFLIA, what we are beginning to think about and look at is after this what next how do we cope 
and we are seeing a situation where wealth is going to be redistributed as per the digital literacy levels of people because almost everything has gone online everything has gone online and when and when you don't um, know how to uh, um navigate online spaces you might have problems so we are looking at that then we're also thinking of open nets you know how do we get into get libraries to understand to get fully into open educational resources open knowledge open education because we can't afford to close things up anymore knowledge must be there information must be free must be open so that people can learn and understand and carry on with their lives because times have changed we we see a situation where after this you know we we need to advocate for policies that will help us with internet access because um, so many communities in in um, like a place in in uganda a small library nakaseke that is the only source of um, internet for the whole community and the library is closed down and there's no wi-fi so what happens to all the people there they don't get information so those are the areas that we are looking at at the next steps to take so that people can continue being connected nobody hopes that this kind of crisis will come up again but who knows tomorrow so that is um that is what we've been doing in africa Thank you very much. Thank you, Nikesh. Hello. It's uh, extraordinary. It's, uh, it, it sounds very familiar, your story, and uh, what, we're, what we're all seeing. Uh, if you could uh, stop your screen share. Oh, oh all right. Great. OK, thank you. Uh, fascinating and um, you know it, it just reminds we're all in this this is this is happening everywhere uh, oh. please please stop screen share it's the same button only reversed oh. uh, we're all in this and, and uh, that's good uh, together and you know figuring out together kind of as one and also each because we're all in different places with different local circumstances. Um, we have come up on our hour, and I, I, I feel like uh, uh, it, it's a, uh, we, we don't want to cut Hayford off. So Hayford, I'm going to ask if you'll return next week and kick off our session uh, rather than trying to cram you into just a very few minutes here today. Uh, I apologize. I took too much time in the intro and talking about the uh, IMLS presentation. I'll try to do better next time, everyone, and uh, so we can cover all of our times. Uh, as I said before, we'll stay on here for as long as people want to chat or talk about anything, but I hope that's okay. Hey, Hayford, are you, you on? Can you hear me? Can you confirm? Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Thank you. And my apologies. We look forward right. to you can make it next week, okay? Yes, yes. It okay, great, fine. great. All right. Well, we'll look forward to that and get a wider picture across the continent. Uh it's it's fascinating. It's scary. And you know, you guys are doing heroic work. All librarians are doing heroic work that society depends on. So um I think we're at the hour, so We'll formally conclude this week's session. Thanks, everybody. Keep, uh, keep on the lookout. We'll probably be distributing uh, a survey this next week to get some specific interests that people have, uh, or type it in the chat right now. We'll try to compile those and arrange for uh, more great speakers like we've had uh, throughout this, uh, this series. So with that, um, We'll call this an official close to the 
uh, April 17, 2020 pandemic response.